call to talk to the Fortune 500, who they get their money from. Right, right. I, I, I get it. Now, I've got more to say on that, so, so hang in there. Uh, so c customers are willing, to, they're, they're saying they're willing to pay more. I'm not convinced. Uh, investment attractiveness. I found a few studies that basically said this. Firms have two customers. The consumer who buys the stuff. I agree. And those people who provide financial capital to the firm buying its stocks and bonds. I agree with that. Shareholders recommend that the top priorities for corporate expenditures should be to clean up the environment and create greener products and promote sustainability. Increased dividends were ranked lower at third place. If I know my corporate America, I'm not buying that. But if I'm filling out a survey, I'm saying all the right things. If I'm a vice president, a director, or a CEO. Like I told you, I sat down with over 50 companies last semester, all of which you'd recognize the names of, and none of them said what that is saying there. This is one of our top priorities right now. You can hear crickets chirping in that room where it wasn't a priority for them. So hang in there. I'm trying to get at, these are some legitimate reasons for why there is momentum. Uh, if you go to the next page, Is that page five, or page four, disaggregation of overhead costs. Uh, if you look at a manufacturing company, a company that builds something, keep it simple. They have three types of costs. They have direct material costs, direct labor costs, and then everything else is called overhead, okay? Corporate America for the last 20, 30 years has been obsessed with reducing direct material and direct labor costs. And they've gotten very good at it. It's almost gotten to the point where, you know, there's not a lot left there to do in terms of cutting costs. So corporate America is saying, okay, now we have these overhead costs that we haven't been paying attention to that much. Let's start hacking away at those costs. Because if you can cut costs by $1, that's the same thing as giving a company $1 worth of pre-tax profit. So you go into a company, you work for someone, and you figure out how to do something better, faster, and cheaper. And you go to your boss and you say, I've cut our costs by $1. You've done the same thing as going to your boss and saying, I've given our company $1 worth of pre-tax profit. You could double sales and maybe give them two extra cents. It's not nearly as effective as cutting costs. So corporate America has gotten really good at cutting costs. It's very effective in terms of widening margins, increasing asset turnover rate, and pumping up ROI. So now their focus is on, okay, let's start plugging away at these overhead costs. My point there is, if you look at waste and pollution and not being green and not being sustainable, those costs are huge and they get thrown into an overhead account. And one of the reasons companies have struggled with managing these costs is they haven't been tracking them, keeping track of it. They don't know the costs in detail. They don't know the costs where they're coming from in excruciating detail. It's really hard to cut costs if you don't know what your costs are, if you don't know where your costs are coming from. And I'm saying for a lot of environmental types of costs like pollution, they don't know exactly what they are, where they're coming from, but the bills get paid. And it's really hard to get better at that if you're not measuring it and you don't know where it's coming from. So corporate America is finally acknowledging that we can still pursue our passion of widening margins and pumping up asset turnover rate and increasing ROI. And the next frontier for them will be on overhead. And within overhead comes pollution. So there's potential there for it to be industry driven from that standpoint that you can increase profitability and be greener and be more sustainable but for industry and corporate America it tends to have to be profit driven because that's how they roll because so much revolves around shareholder value today. If you go to the next page ability to influence regulations another reason why companies might decide to be greener is if they're the best at sustainability if regulatory agencies might actually come to them for the standards and the benchmark that other companies should have to follow. So if you're always a leader, you're never behind, and you set the benchmark and standard for industry. So I think a lot of companies uh, decide to take on sustainability for that reason, that they want to be the benchmark for everyone else, especially their competition. Imagine if you're in industry, you're competing against a bunch of companies, and they're always chasing you on these regulations that have something to do with pollution, waste, and sustainability. Uh, problems with disposal. It's getting really expensive. I worked at General Motors in the late 80s at a truck plant, and we would make trucks and stick parts together. And there would be a lot of stuff left over. There'd be like carpet left over, metal left over. And you'd think, why not design the truck in a way so that when you stick the parts together, nothing's left over? They didn't even think in those terms back in the late 80s. Uh, they thought, well, actually, they just didn't even cross their mind at that point. So they were sending a bunch of solid waste to landfills, local municipalities, where they have to pay like by the ton and get insurance and all that stuff and label it a certain way. They were sending so much stuff to the landfill, to a local municipality landfill 
that they couldn't afford to send it there anymore. So what would you do if you were an executive, a director, or a VP? You'd probably say, well, build the damn trucks in a way where there's no stuff left over. No, that would be way too uh, leading edge. What they decided was, we'll put it on trucks and trains, depending on what uh, fuel prices are. We'll open up our own landfill in South Dakota, and we'll ship it out there. General Motors opened up their own landfill in South Dakota for mostly truck and car plants that were in the metro Detroit area. Not too proactive, right? But that was their solution to dealing with, it's too expensive to send it at the local landfill, so we'll send it out to our own in South Dakota. They ran the numbers, they crunched the numbers, they did the economics, and they said, this actually generated cost savings for us, so let's do it this way, versus just saying, how about we didn't create the crap in the first place, so we don't have to open up a landfill. It would require an investment, it would require training. It might not actually accomplish anything for five to 10 years down the road, but guess what? You never had to open up a landfill in the process, one of which is still operating today. All right, so I'm trying to wrap it up here as to all the reasons that companies uh, are trying. Four, five, page six. There is some data out there that basically says the companies that are sustainable, that are greener, that take the environment seriously, that take child labor law seriously, that take energy seriously. I was in uh, Seattle, Washington this past summer. I have a former student of mine. He's created his own company. His company basically is, he's created a framework for sustainability that doesn't just focus on, on just energy, that doesn't just focus on child labor, that doesn't just focus on uh, pollution. Because what he noticed was, he was out in the workforce, and there were all these different standards for doing this really well, this really well, and this really well. But there wasn't one comprehensive uh, framework that corporate America could buy into, so he created one, and he has this rubber stamp. The company's called Verigo, and he basically says, if you do this framework, it's all encompassing, and you can get a rubber stamp from my company that says, you take sustainability very seriously. So he has a round table now of companies that have looked at his framework, and they've said, you know what? This is pretty good, and if we do this and then use it with our suppliers, we're gonna not only do things better, faster, and cheaper, we're gonna be more sustainable, we're gonna get waste, out of our company, and that's the right thing to do, but anytime you get rid of waste, which is always non-value added, you actually do things better, faster, and cheaper, and make more money. So I went out there to Seattle, Washington. The meeting was at Microsoft headquarters. Oddly enough, an example of a company that's one of the most successful in human history that reached the point where they got big and fat. I was there, and on the day of the meeting, it was announced that Microsoft was laying 18,000 people. Uh, so that was a bad time to have a meeting and be at Microsoft headquarters because that had never happened at Microsoft before. But they had a meeting with a bunch of other companies, uh, Honeywell, Nike, Coors, Kellogg's. We basically sat in a circle and said, this stuff's really important, but we need a framework that we can work with that doesn't just focus on bits and pieces of sustainability that puts it all together. So I actually had a student, uh, former student, that has a company now that this is gaining momentum. Honeywell is test piloting it. A couple of other companies are likewise test piloting it. They're very happy with the results, the return on investment, the payback period, its impact on sustainability. So that's all going very well. But the point I was trying to make is it looks like if you look at sustainability and the companies that are said to be sustainable and you study them, they make a lot of money. And so maybe we can be sustainable, more environmentally responsible and greener and still be very profitable. Maybe the way to look at it is it's waste, and all waste is non-value added, which increases costs and lowers performance. So maybe this is an, the next step of uh, the cost revolution or quality revolution that's going on. All right, so the next page, this is kind of the more important one that I wanted to talk about, is the fact is most companies aren't sustainable. They're not environmentally responsible. Uh, they're not socially responsible. So like, what's the big hang up and the problem? Why do they struggle with this? Why is it not a priority? So on page seven, First bullet I have is, it says, top management must be willing to accept and champion corporate-wide development if these developments are to be accepted. Vice presidents and CEOs got to back it up. I, I hate to be cynical, but if I'm a vice president or a CEO, and I know I only got two to five to 10 years left, and a huge part of my compensation package is in the company stock, and I know what makes stock, stock prices go up. You widen margins. How do you widen margins? You cut costs. Uh, you increase asset turnover rate. You do more with less. How do you do that? You outsource more. Your ROI goes up. Your stock goes up. 
I go to Naples, Florida in the wintertime, richest place in the world during the wintertime. Has more billionaires and millionaires per capita than any other place in the world. I start meeting these people. A lot of them are from the Midwest. Like, where'd you work? What companies did you work for? You'd be shocked at how many of them are uh, former auto industry executive titan types that are worth 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 million dollars. I, I kind of get it. Uh, if I can cut costs really quickly by outsourcing to something to China because it'll cost me 30 cents per part versus a dollar part, I can reduce my direct material cost and that has a direct impact on my bot bottom line almost immediately. Stock goes up, my compensation goes up, but 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the road when that part sucks in quality, when the lead times are really long, when the insurance is really expensive. In the auto industry there's data that basically proves 20 years into this, 20 years ago, if you bought a part from Indiana for a dollar and you bought it for 70 cents from China, we got 20 years worth of data now that says the China part's way, way, way more expensive. It's actually like $1.50 uh, because you have larger inventories, longer lead times, more expensive insurance, more freight. You add all those costs up over the time period that you're buying the parts from China it's way more expensive than a dollar, so it actually would have been cheaper. But there's some executive that made that decision that is a multi-millionaire because of that decision, and right now it's killing companies because they're stuck with that sourcing decision 5, 10, 15, 20 years later, and they're trying to make sense out of the data and say, well, actually the data says this, why did we make this decision back then? There's someone out there that's a little self-serving, that's focused on doing things better, faster, and cheaper, and not thinking long-term, and that sometimes includes not considering sustainability. Yes, I, um, as you talk, very valid points and talking about the executive, the top who says, I have a five, 10 years uh, and whatever I get, I rake, what I, I'm gonna use the word again, I don't need to be offensive, I rake whatever I can. Yep. There, is an, there is a behavioral paradigm change and it's slowly happening and it has to, I guess I perceive it as such, it, some of it has to occur because that too, I question everlasting sustainability. Yep. But there is a different way, absolutely, I agree. Anyway. Yep. In the auto industry, my students go out in the auto industry and they, they buy parts for Ford. Their, their boss's boss's boss tells them, you have to cut costs by 5% a year. So if you buy a part for a dollar, okay, you have to cut those costs by 5% a year. Okay, so, so after five years, you want to pay, what is that, 75 cents per part? Then after 10 years, you expect to buy that part for 50 cents per part. So what I've noticed is, and I'm informally doing a study on this, if you look at the vice presidents of, say, operations or supply chain management, to what extent are their bonuses contingent on them generating an immediate cost savings? So you got the CEO saying, this is what your compensation package is going to look like. I'll bet you it's a very large component of that. And the problem with that is you tend to be very short-sighted in, in your considerations. Uh, especially, again, let's say in your 50s or 60s or 70s, and you know you're out in five years, they know how to do stuff that can save companies billions of dollars, but they're not thinking beyond 5, 10, 15 years because they're going to be down in Naples, Florida in a multi-million dollar house. And that's, a, that's the self-serving egotistical part that I struggle with is we need the people at the top of the food chain starting to think like us. So by doing this right now, you guys will be at the top of the food chain, in your case, Sally, five years. In your case, three. In your case, maybe 12. Okay, so joking, I'm just joking. Uh, moving on. Uh, are customers really willing to pay the added costs associated with having something that is socially responsible if that actually means companies have to increase their costs? Uh, there are many reported cases of sustainability investments which have resulted in negative returns. Uh, sustainability investments have actually lowered the value of some firms' stocks. Th there's, uh, there's some data out there that says if you invest in sustainability, that it doesn't pay for itself as quickly as corporate America likes or is used to. Ali, I'm going to pick on you again since you're one of my students. Let's say you go to your boss and you say, boss, give me a dollar. I'm going to invest that dollar in our company. It's going to save us at least a dollar. Your boss is going to say, how long will it take for that one dollar investment to save me at least a dollar? In corporate America out there, what do you think the going rate is for payback period? Um, one quarter. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was going to say six to, six to 12 months. Yeah. I was gonna say yeah. 
the problem with a lot of the greener investments, like when you want to increase like recyclability content, you want to stick parts together where there's nothing left over, uh, the payback period, it's there, there's a return on investment, but it tends to be a little further out. So if you're an executive that's not going to be there a little further out, you're less inclined to green light investments that don't have a payback period of six months or less. Ideally, you walk in there, you say, it'll pay for itself in two weeks. Boss says, here's the dollar, that's a no-brainer. That's going to make me look really good. And back, we're back to ego, it's going to make me look really good. But I would argue too, if you can do something that doesn't have long-term consequences where it pays for itself in two weeks, there's probably something to that. A big cost in industry is tools and equipment are breaking down and that costs factories lots of money because of tons of downtime. They implement software that says clean your tools on these dates and they won't break down. So you can spend a million bucks on software. That's an investment that pays for itself in about two weeks. So that's a no-brainer for a manager. The thing is they don't have an unlimited supply of resources. So if they have a dollar to spend, they're saying, I'll spend it on the preventative maintenance software because the payback period is two weeks. But if I increase the recyclability content, gosh, that could be way down the road. What am I going to do with that one dollar that the vice president gave me to invest to help do things better, faster, and cheaper? So there's a little bit of a struggle out there for managers because when they look at the art return on investment in the payback period, the numbers aren't working for them when it comes to stuff that tends to be a little greener. Uh, here's another one. How do firms incorporate sustainability issues into the...